I'm Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to Arts in the City. We are coming to you from the Museum of Arts and Design and we'll show you a fascinating exhibit you can check out a little bit later in the show. But first, a story from inside the Arts in the City family. Our very own Eddie Bailey has just wrapped up a new documentary that beautifully connects the dots between a form of dance, history, and the civil rights movement in Memphis. It was in many ways a journey home for Eddie. Donna Hanover has a preview. In Memphis Magic, documentary filmmaker Eddie Bailey draws a clear and direct line connecting structural racism dating back to the Civil War to the current prosperity of one of America's major port cities. And somehow Bailey manages to make it all very entertaining in a documentary about dance. Juking the dance style from Memphis looked like urban ballet. And I would wonder, why isn't this dance a household name? Why is this dance 30 years old and no one knows about it? And I would always get the uh, answer that Memphis doesn't have a lot of avenues. A dance that's been around for 30 years and as beautiful as that and no one knows about it, that's when I said it's more than dance. This is about the infrastructure of Memphis. What is jucking? So when you think of ballet, you think about, you know, men and women being on point, you know, on their toes. So when you think about juking, you think about this dance that has this, this southern hip hop rhythm mixed with kind of soul and blues. And all of a sudden you see these guys doing toe spins and doing one and two revolutions on their toes and sneakers. I don't really do nothing but juke. I'm not doing like other young guys are doing, like they're out selling drugs shooting and all that stuff, and I'm staying positive. So you have this orchid or this rose in the middle of the cement, and you wonder why it's not out there. And it's because of a larger history of racism and political corruption in Memphis. There is a statute, which is a governmental order, that says we cannot disturb or defame or alter this heinous, hateful statue. It's on the books. It's on the books because white supremacists know symbols matter. The lead characters in the documentary are both modern and historic. And why did you focus on them? We're in a time where we need to connect the present to the past. and have a better understanding of where we are now and why we are where we are now. I think the connection of the past and, and, and the present helps you to understand you better. It helps black folks to understand their position better and it helps Americans to understand their America better. How did you come up with the title? I didn't know what I was gonna call it first. It was gonna be Memphis something, right? But then I said Memphis magic, that sounds pretty cool. Right? This was about three or four years ago. As I started developing the documentary, the documentary started to grow, magic then became a, a title of irony because the magic never really got to develop in Memphis. And the reason why magic is spelled with the J is because the J is for juking. And so juking could be that magic. What is your history with Memphis? Juking helped me to rediscover Memphis. And in so doing, I discovered the roots of my family. I never thought that my family participated in the civil rights movement. And people would actually ask me, did your family participate in it? And I'm like, no, nah. because I just didn't know. And it would be good to know that at 12, you know, when I, when I, when I was a, a, a young teenager or a preteen, you know, coming of age and, you know, trying to, you know, figure out my lane in the world. Um, so to know that and to know that I'm a part of uh, that, that legacy, a part of that history, is, is just it's filling for me. And it, it helps me to, to understand that I have a, uh, my purpose here, my purpose for making films is to, to tell the, the African American story and to tell it in a way that's dignified, that's truthful, that's unashamed, and that's... Uh, necessary uh, because it's not only necessary for uh, black Americans in this country, it's necessary for all Americans uh, so that they can see uh, what, what black folks have done and what 
black people had to go through to be American citizens. Memphis Magic will be available for streaming in February, and you can follow the film on Facebook and Instagram. Neil Rosen has quite the celebrity lineup for us today. He sat down with the stars and director of Mary Poppins Returns. Goodbye, Mary Poppins. Don't stay away too long. Well, it's been 54 years since Mary Poppins first hit movie screens, with Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke delighting generations of children with a very special blend of magic and song. Now, the magical London nanny is back. Mary Poppins, who came back? In the new movie, Mary Poppins Returns, directed by Rob Marshall, Emily Blunt stars in the title role, while Hamilton's Lin-Manuel Miranda co-stars. It is my great honor to introduce this evening's renowned guest, the one, the only, Mary Poppins! The action picks up 25 years later, and the Banks children, now all grown up, have two kids of their own. What brings you here after all this time? Same thing that brought me the first time. I've come to look after the Banks children. Us? Oh, yes, you too. So, you know, you're stepping into really iconic shoes here. I mean, yes. I saw this movie, I don't want to date myself, but as a little kid, you know, I'm sure you've seen you the movie. You saw it a hundred years ago. But I did, I did. So did you have any reluctance, like, taking this on? No reluctance, a little trepidation, but mainly complete excitement, actually, because she's such a delicious, amazing character. So I was more overwhelmed by the excitement of it. And Rob Marshall is certainly a very comforting thought for me when embarking on something as iconic as this, because he's my friend and I've worked with him and I knew that he would make something that would honor the original and yet be something new. Everybody thinks that Julie Andrews thing, I mean, how do you approach something like this? I just try and approach it like, a, like I would any other part. I try to allow all of that sort of gasping reaction when I told people I was gonna play Mary Poppins <laughs> to be like white noise. I had to just sort of approach her as I would any other character. Nice to see you, Jack. Good to see you too, Mary Poppins. So, you know, after Hamilton, you could have done anything. I mean, anything you wanted to do. And you chose to do this, which is terrific. But I was wondering what made you want to choose this out of the, the world was your oyster, as they say. Rob Marshall. That's my answer. Um, I think that Rob Marshall is one of the best musical directors ever. Uh, I think he's created the gold standard with that first movie, Chicago, um, in terms of how you adapt musical stories to the screen. Um, this was his first original musical. I was not gonna miss being in the room for that. And listen, I danced along to these penguins with my VHS cassette as a kid, just like everybody else. So Mary Poppins is in my DNA as much as anybody's. But you know, everything that you've done to my knowledge, you had complete creative control. I mean, from In the Heights, Moana, you did the songs, I mean, Hamilton. What was it like being in, you know, just kind of being a gun for hire, so to speak, and not was, writing the song? It was the greatest. <laughs> well, you know, you have to understand, I always wanted a life in musicals, and I started writing in the Heights because I realized at 18, oh, outside of high school, no one's ever gonna cast me as Bernardo, and no one's ever gonna cast me as Paul in a chorus line. I don't dance ballet that well. And if you're a Puerto Rican guy, that's what's in the canon. And so I started writing in the Heights because I knew I'd have to create my own opportunities. And so this feels like the fruit of that harvest, to, to get offered a role like this after a lot of hard work making my own opportunities. You're doing an amazing thing, which is going to be reprising the role um, in, of Hamilton for uh, hurricane relief in Puerto Rico. Um, how does it feel to be doing that role again? I mean, you, you, you know, you got away from it and now... I'll, I'll tell you when I get there. I mean, honestly, when I l watch the show now, it feels like in my brain, the files are on all on my desk, but they're a little messy. <laughs> like, I don't quite have the words back yet. I've done it in two and a half years. So, you know, I'm gonna need a little rehearsal, but um, I'm, I'm super proud of doing it. I'm hoping we raise a lot of money for arts artists and arts organizations on the island, and uh, I'm always thrilled to bring my work to, to that island. Was it tough to get Lin-Manuel Lin Miranda to do this? Well, you know what, he wanted to do this. I mean, I was so thrilled. I sat with him, 
I mean, I love his work as an actor. So I, I see that. I see his work as an actor, I'm not just this brilliant genius creator that he is. One of the big reasons why I wanted to do this film as well was the message of this film right now in this current climate today. I felt we needed Mary Poppins to return and come back again to actually bring this light back into the world, this injection of hope that we all need. And honestly, that was why this was important to me as a filmmaker. It's a good thing you come along when you did, Mary Poppins. With Emily Blunt, Lin-Manuel Miranda, and Rob Marshall, for Arts in the City, I'm Neil Rosen. Off we go. In Book It Today, author Therese Ann Fowler. You may remember her bestseller, Z, a novel of Zelda Fitzgerald. She's back with another book, A Well-Behaved Woman, a novel of the Vanderbilts. And lucky us, she stopped by to chat about it. Therese, thank you so much for coming by. I'm so happy to meet you. I'm delighted to be here. So your book is called A Well-Behaved Woman. First of all, I loved it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's about the Vanderbilts. And you know, I, I think I know a bit about the Vanderbilts, but I was surprised I'm not that familiar with this story. So can you give us a little bit of a description? Sure. Well, I mean, that was the experience that I had, too. I've heard the name Vanderbilt, but I didn't really know very much about any of them. It was um, when I came upon this article about little Gloria, who we know as Gloria Vanderbilt, and the custody battle between her mother and her aunt that I first became intrigued with the family in general. And so with each successive generation, I was moving backward in time yeah. to the point where I came upon the Vanderbilts sort of as they are coming to be um, in society in New York City in the late 1800s. And it turns out that there was a key woman involved in that evolution, and her name was Alva Smith. She marries into the family and then kind of becomes this, um, I don't know, she's like a lightning rod of a woman in her time, and I was, of course, fascinated by that. Well, as you describe it in the book, she uh, married William Vanderbilt essentially for money. Absolutely. Because for they money. were desperate, her family was desperate That's at right. that point. That's right. She didn't necessarily expect to love her husband, she just needed the marriage to work so that her sisters could be supported and her father, who was an invalid, could be supported. She thought she was doing a good turn for the family. William is not exactly the husband she feels she deserves on some level. Well, I think she imagined that if she behaves respectfully, she will be treated respectfully. And the idea that, that these men can just go out and have whatever they want on the side, which was not an uncommon practice, she takes that personally, not just for herself, but for other women of her class. Both in history and in the book, Alva shocks everyone when she actually decides to divorce William. How do you think Alva had the fortitude ultimately to seek that divorce, as opposed to right. do what would be more expected of her? Which is to just yeah. sit, you know, deal with it and keep her mouth shut. Well, so that kind of goes back to the idea of her being sort of less of the, the reputation that she's earned, right? If, if all she really cared about were her social status and her money, she would never have taken that action. She wouldn't divorce the man who enables her to have this place in society. It's not, it's not a sensible choice. So obviously she's driven by things that have nothing to do with materialism and have a lot more to do with self-respect. Alva lived a good long life and she was able to accomplish a lot of things, especially with the women's suffrage movement. She was a a tremendous advocate and put not only her own money but her time and you know personal effort into that movement. Your previous book, Z, was very successful. Very successful, yes. I have to ask, was it difficult for you to attempt another one in any way, to think like, I have to match that level of success? I knew that I had to produce a story that the readers who love Z would also find appealing. I mean, 
when I say I needed to, that's personal on me. I probably could have written anything and just said, but oh, well, I to. had a successful novel, therefore I can write whatever I want. But that's not me. I think, you know, it's a kind of an act of faith between the writer and the reader, where if you loved a thing that I did before, I really want you to love the thing I do next. Right. So, Therese, we always ask people this. Um, do you have any particular habits or quirks that are part of your writing, any rituals that you do that help you get started? I'm just kind of a workhorse about it. I write full time and I treat it like a job because I would like to get the next book done so that I can pursue the idea that's already, you know, in the back of my head about what to right? do next. Yeah. So you write at home or I you do. write elsewhere? I write at home. I have a, an office on one end of the house, on the second floor of my house, and my husband, who is also an author, has his office on the opposite end. And um, there's a lot of back and forth of cats. That's funny. <laughs> That's, I mean, you know, there's that joke about how you get cats and you think you're going to go ahead and have the serious occupation of whatever your profession may be, but in fact, you've just become a doorman for, yes. the, for the cats. <laughs> yes. I kind of feel like that with our dog, so yeah. I know what Same you mean. Idea. <laughs> Therese, thank you so much for coming by. I really enjoyed it. It was a delight. Thank you. Unlocking the past through old photos, Mike Gilliam introduces us to a photographer who combines detective work and detailed restoration, revealing a remarkable snapshot of history. I'm Mike Gilliam. Photographer Ray Simone does more than just take pictures. He searches all over the world for old negatives that he painstakingly restores one at a time. One day I came across a box of photos with a negative in it. And um, when I found the negative, I decided, well, let me just let me buy this. And then one led to another, which led to 20, which led to 200 and maybe 2,000 by now. I've been collecting negatives for um, roughly 25 years, and I've been restoring them about 10. Ray Simone does all of his work in his home, uncovering through painstaking restoration work a range of subjects like workers on New York's old trolley cars. Okay, these are original um, glass plate negatives from roughly anywhere between 1915 and 1920. These were um, of the uh, New York City trolley cars, um, the, uh, the conductors and their assistants. In, they were in quite bad uh, disarray when I bought them. You could even see, too, a lot of the deterioration uh, taking place, as well as discoloration within the negative itself. This one was quite, uh, quite difficult to retouch, but I think one of the nicest ones out of a, out of a, uh, a set of 35. This one was about uh, 40 to 50 uh, work hours of retouching. Uh, it's it's uh, quite beautiful. Ray's restoration work ranges from cityscapes to music icons, sports figures, and celebrities, including the chairman, Frank Sinatra. I mean, I have a lot of celebrity. I have a lot of, you know, I grew up as an Italian-American, my father, so the, the background to my life, the music was Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Tony Bennett, and that's what I always heard. And, and um, one of the first celebrity negatives I ever bought was a Frank Sinatra saying, wow, this, is re this looks really nice with the fedora on by the piano, and I thought it was great. Um, but I also like average person doing average things that we don't know, we don't know what they did in their life. Well, well actually, some of them you do because they're, at, they're on the job. But I mean, what did their life become? Who, who are they? What did they do? What, what was their achievements? And these glass negatives, which were in use as far back as the 19th century, provide a unique set of challenges for Ray. Many of these were, is the uh, photographer right on site would actually put the emulsion right on site uh, of the glass and then take the photograph and then develop it. If they're kept properly, if they're kept you know, in an acid-free uh, holder and they're kept in a, in a, in a, in a in a humidity-regulated uh, environment, they could last uh, quite, I mean, these are 100 years old. I have others that are 120 years old. There's one I'm trying to work on now. I, 
I'm not going to say I gave up. It's Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. It's an absolutely stunning image, but um, it is really taking its toll on me. Uh, I, I worked on it for, I, I probably put about 20 hours in it and it doesn't look like I worked on it for one. The negative is it was very, very badly damaged. It was, uh, you can see the, the emulsion is corroded here. Um, uh, I'm assuming the, the person who developed the film didn't do, uh, leave it in the stop bath uh, long enough and um, it's, it's, just, it's just eaten away and it's a, a discoloration, it's discoloring terribly. So um, there's a lot of pieces of the emulsion that are missing. I had to step away because it's just too much work. But I just couldn't say no to, I just couldn't say no to it. I enjoy history and looking at the past and let's hope that we can learn a lot from what went, went on before. Maybe we could emulate some things and change some others. And um, I just enjoy looking and working on those things. I, 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 I feel comfortable being surrounded by, that's why my studio was just surrounded by surrounded by things long before I was born. It gives me uh, meaning to wake up the next day and start all over again. For more, you can check out Ray's website, Photo Gallery NYC. There you can dig deeper into his work as he restores history one negative at a time. I'm Mike Gilliam for Arts in the City. Late night comic David Letterman signed off more than three years ago after decades of laughter. Barry Mitchell has more on a new book that goes inside the final weeks of the iconic television show. The uh, only thing I have left to do for the last time on a television program, thank you and good night. On May 20th, 2015, David Letterman said goodbye to late night TV after a 33 year run on NBC and CBS. One super fan was so sorry to see him go, he wrote a book. I really wanted to capture the memories of the people who worked there. Scott Ryan is the author of The Last Days of Letterman. Welcome. Thank you. And with us is a real treat. We have Jill Goodwin, one of the writers from Late Show with David Letterman. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Why now a book about Letterman? It's been three and a half years almost since the show went off the air. It has been three and a half years, but the world has changed so much in that time. I really wanted to capture the memories of the people who worked there. And this is an oral history. Correct. So it is, in their words, exactly about each episode of the last six weeks. We all knew we had a job to do, but there was a different kind of electricity in the last six weeks. We all knew that these shows were special. We all knew that everyone was trying to bring their best to the table to make Dave really proud of the end of his run. Writer Jill Goodwin. Maybe today I'll get to meet Dave. <laughs> I started as a finance intern and was able to move to the production side of the show and then from there, the writing side. If Dave's tickled by a piece that you had on, you really don't care about if the audience laughs or not. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the win. Like right, if right. the audience is silent, but you can tell Dave is right. genuinely tickled by something, then that's all you need. Dave likes something that would catch him off guard a little bit. He, he just appreciated stuff that was like a little off. I saw one of your fake commercials and I laughed out loud. Discount retailer Dollar Tree is buying competitor Family Dollar for $8.5 billion. One, <laughs> two, three, four, 149, 150, 151. My take on his style of comedy early on was sarcastic, sort of put down and detached. When he started, like at NBC, he was kind of had this college young guy persona, and he, he kind of morphed into more like of a comforting fatherly role that was, you know, we could go for laughs, but you know, um, after terrible things happened, we could go to him for like words of wisdom. And, and we're told that they were uh, zealots uh, fueled by religious fervor, religious fervor. And if you live to be a thousand years old, will that make any sense to you? Will that make any goddamn sense? <sighs> and that's where his uh, 
his comedy skill really meshed well with his, I mean, he was a fantastic broadcaster. And that's where those kind of worlds just, you know, made magic, in my opinion. Did David Letterman request the celebrities that were on the last few weeks? He was really interested in the music guests. Oh, darling, darling, stand by me. In fact, he requested Stand By Me, which he used to sing to his son, Harry, and they got Tracy Chapman to do that. Stand by me. It means a great deal to me. I'm so happy you could do this for us. Jill, what do you remember about the very last show? I kind of sneaked down to the, the theater and stood in the back of the house during the standing ovation and the clapping, and I just remember I'm never gonna forget this feeling. <laughs> and then everyone just kind of walked around like, what, it's, all, it's really all over? And we partied after that and that was it. And Scott, what do you remember about the last show? I watched it at home in the dark in my underwear. Our thanks to Stand Up New York at 236 West 78th Street for use of the room. Thank you both. <laughs> I'm Barry Mitchell, you're watching Arts in the City. And that is our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us. Remember, you can find us online anytime you need your New York City arts and culture fix. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. We'll see you next time on Arts in the City.